the top of North Twin Cone Peak in Colorado, welcome to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by Wiggle. Coming up this week, are ketones a magic bullet influencing the Tour de France this year? GCN investigates. We do indeed. Also, the pro cycling transfer rumour mill is now in full swing and we're going to announce the very, very lucky winner of a personalised Orbea Orca Aero. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Mariana Voss is back to being the boss. Yeah, she won La Corse last week with a devastating late attack. And in the process, she covered a very tricky final kilometer, just two seconds slower than Julien Alaphilippe did later that day, whilst riding a time trial bike to victory and having only covered 27.5 kilometers. Not only that, she was also seven seconds faster than Geraint Thomas over that same distance. Yeah. We also learned last week that being at the back of the Tour de France can be just as hard as being being at the front. Yeah, this is something you probably knew already, Dan. But anyway, we were reminded last week as Jens de Boucheret crossed the finish line on the Col de Tourmalet, second from last, absolutely spent. We also learned that the stupid Tour de France rules that we discussed on the show last week are not, of course, confined to the Tour de France. This is a tweet from top pro Christine Majerus. UCI Commissaire made me lower my socks by one centimetre today. No wonder my prologue was <laughs> Right, now, at the Tour de France this year, one story has been bubbling away almost since the start, and that is as to whether or not ketones, a nutritional supplement, are so effective they're actually shaping the outcome of the race. Yes, and to find out, we're going to head over to our resident nutritional expert. Who is that, by the way? Hank. Right, I'm ready to go. Really? Oh. No, of course not. I'm gonna go over to Dr. Oliver Bridgewood. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Well, firstly, we need to define what they are. So here is a quick science lesson. Ketones, or to be specific, ketone bodies, are produced naturally inside the body and are a form of fuel that the body can utilise. They consist of three molecules, acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Although, technically speaking, only the first two are ketones, the third is the conjugate base of beta-hydroxybutyric acid. It's technically a carboxylic acid, but you don't need to worry about that. These compounds are created by the body by breaking down fatty acids in the liver. And this occurs when you have low levels of carbohydrate or an absence of carbohydrate. Examples of this situation would be if you were bonking on the bike, if you were engaging in a ketogenic diet, which is low carb, high fat, or if you were fasting or starving. It's the body's natural coping mechanism for when you don't have much carbohydrate, which is its primary fuel source. Got that? So, rather than waiting for the body to start making this alternative fuel, these ketone bodies, the idea behind ketone drinks is to just give you the ketones straight away. It's called exogenous ketones, in the same way that, technically speaking, when you take a gel or some carbohydrate and eat that on a ride, that's technically called exogenous carbohydrates. Consuming exogenous carbohydrate is key to endurance exercise performance, but the amount that your body can take in and process is limited to roughly 1.8 grams per minute, if the correct ratio of sucrose and fructose is used. And that is where exogenous ketones come in. The theory is that you can provide an additional fuel source to the body in addition to the carbohydrate. Now, the difference is that the body will burn carbohydrate in the really intense parts of the race, so attacking, the final climb, sprinting, things like that. But a typical stage of the Tour de France is not always super intense for the pro riders. If they're on the flat and they're sat in the bunch at a quieter moment in the race, they can often only be doing around 100 watts. And at this intensity, the body will happily tick along on ketones, meaning that when they get to that crucial, important moment of the race, they've been able to save their carbs or glycogen stores to use then. Think of it like a hybrid car, where you've got an electric motor paired with a petrol motor. Gasoline, if you're American. Now, if we take, for example, a Toyota Prius, 
then you use the electric motor when you want to make the car more efficient and at lower intensities when you're just ticking along. But if you need to step on it and put the hammer down, then the petrol motor kicks in to help you accelerate. Now, I have to stress that this is a gross oversimplification of what's actually believed to be happening, but hopefully you get the idea. Some scientists suggest that there are potential recovery benefits to taking ketones as well. A study published in the Journal of Medicine and Science for Sports and Exercise showed that taking ketones after exercise increased muscle glycogen synthesis. Now, what this means in non-science speak is the fuel stores inside your muscles are getting replenished with carbohydrate. Now, this is crucial to recovery and is especially important in refilling those fuel stores in an event like the Tour de France, where you've got a race day after day after day. But are ketones the magic bullet that some people are making them out to be? Well, the current science would suggest, although there is likely some benefit, no, they're not. A study by Cox et al. in the Journal of Cell Metabolism took 39 competitive cyclists and looked at their time trial performance. They were given both carbohydrates and ketones, and the result was a modest 2% improvement in time trial performance. Now, to put this into context, even if I took ketones, I wouldn't be good enough to be in the Tour de France. And even in his prime, if Dan Lloyd, when he was riding for the, what was it? Cervelo test team took ketones, then he still wouldn't have graduated to the podium. He, he might have come a bit higher than 161st, which is where he came. That's harsh. It's probably fair. Either way, it would have been dependent on Lloydy actually being able to drink the stuff. And this is no exaggeration, it's reported to taste like nail polish remover. And it may cause gastrointestinal distress. <laughs> Grandma's pants. Another study published in Frontiers of Physiology reported that ketones impaired the performance of world tour professional cyclists in a time trial. The participants in the study took on average a minute longer to complete a 31 kilometer time trial. Now, the results of this were put down to potentially the aforementioned gastrointestinal issues, but it should also be noted that in this study, a different ketone supplement was used than the one that was used in the Cox study. Although, going back to an earlier point, ketones may not be at their best application in a max out time trial effort. They could be better in those longer stage race scenarios where there are points to the race where you're going easier and then able to save the carbohydrates for when you really need them. But there just haven't been enough studies into exogenous ketone supplementation to draw any solid conclusions. More research is required. And there haven't been enough studies into elite athletes either. These highly tuned, extremely talented individuals often respond differently. This is not to say that exogenous ketones are not being taken at the Tour de France. A couple of teams have said that they are. And it's also not to say that they're not helping. But we asked a couple of top nutritionists who work with the teams, and they both said the same thing. The effect is being greatly exaggerated. Back to the studio. Food for thought there. Cheers, Ollie. I see what you did there. Right, next up, we've been sent a dispatch by Mark Beaumont this week, which focuses on his two main passions, ultra endurance and utterly bonkers. I thought I'd do a little bit of impromptu reporting. I've been at the National Cross Country Mountain Bike Champs uh, all day today, which was amazing. And the guy holding my phone is Alex Glasgow, uh, who came third in uh, his age group. But the reason that I've stopped here in Knutsford in East Cheshire is because uh, another buddy of mine, Richard Thoddy, should, if his tracker's anything to believe, come around that corner in the next couple of minutes. On a penny farthing. Now, back in 1886, a GP Mills, I think a teenager, allegedly rode from Land's End to John O'Groats in five days, one hour and 45 minutes. There was no tarmac roads. And, uh, well, Land's End John O'Groats in five days is insanely impressive by anyone. Doing it on one of these contraptions is pretty hard to get your head around. Nobody's come close to that in the last decade plus. Six o'clock yesterday morning, Richard left from Land's End and on day one made it 175 miles. 
and uh, well, we're coming up to seven o'clock on his second day. Go on, that man. You want to keep going? Oh, oh what, what a hero! What an absolute hero! Oh, come here, big man. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing, I'm doing great, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm great. That, 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 that. You look like you're having a good time. Yeah, actually. You get a little dips, don't you? But generally, yeah. it's, it's been fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Superb. Have you had some good roadside support? Brilliant today, yeah, because yeah. it's kind of near home turf here, so there's been a lot of yeah, people yeah, out. Yeah, of course. A lot of people just back up the road. Day one, smashed out. How far? Just under 200. Just under 200 miles yeah. yesterday. Schedule was for 170, I think. Right. But uh, going well. Yeah, eight for uh, Devon and Cornwall. It's brutal. Oh, it's not a place to ride a penny farther. It's, it's not a, a scary place to be. It's, it's hard on uh, any bicycle. But it's just keep, there's nothing to interrupt you. Yeah. So you just keep going. Well, like today, in, th in theory, I should have been faster today because it's flatter. Yeah. But there's so many junctions and traffic lights yeah, and town sure. centres and stuff. It just slows you down. And was there any hills yesterday you just had to walk the bike up? No. No. Really? Come on. The worst one is up to Bristol Airport. Right. A38. There's a, there's a real beast of a climb up to that. Oh. Like right at the end of the ride before you drop down to Bristol where we were stopping. And uh, yeah, that was a bit of a... But I get a bit, uh, I get a bit belligerent with them. I should, I should really have got off and walked up to save my legs a bit, you know. But... Well, it been much slower, but I've been watching closely with all the social media updates and there's a massive amount of uh, people tuning into this and following every update on the tracker, so um, yeah, staggering stuff, love it. It's, at the moment, it's going, it's going to plan. Well, don't, uh, don't give up too much time for us. I want to see you smash this. <laughs> okay. We recently launched a new uh, collection on the GCN shop, which is going out very well indeed. But would you believe it? We've got another one, a super cool new design, haven't we, Dan? We have. Our new fan kit, and this is called the Strive Collection. Check yeah. those out. So you can use that whilst you're getting the miles under your belt in the nice warm summer sunshine. And it also has the base layer too. But not only that, we've got some casual clothing to match it. So this is what you can put on afterwards, after you've had your shower, when you're relaxing after those hard miles, sipping on a mineral water yeah. or two. Yeah, that's right. You don't want to know what else we got under this desk, by the way, that we're just about to pull out and show you guys. But uh, anyway, uh, this cycling kit is available in both men's and women's fit, and it's all available on the GCN shop right now. Yeah, there's a link to that in the description below. Next up, it is of course your weekly GCN inspiration, which is your chance to submit photos and potentially win one of three wiggle voucher amounts. If you get third place on the day, you will get £50 of vouchers, second place will get you £75, and the winner each week picks up £100 of vouchers to do with whatever they want on the Wiggle Online shop. Nice. Now, rounding out our podium in third place, we've got this sent in from David from Littleton, New Zealand. He said, treated myself to a Cervelo R5 before emigrating to New Zealand. Fast forward five months, eagerly awaiting shipment from the UK. The bike arrived for its first ride and it didn't disappoint. That's a cool photo as well, isn't it? I love the whole like first ride anticipation of your super bike. Yeah. Plus a mint place. You also treated yourself to going to New Zealand, really, didn't you? Not just the R5 there, that looks magnificent. Sounds like a double win, doesn't it? Uh, in second place, we had this one in from Mac in Reno and Nevada. One of my favourite local gravel roads on the perfect early summer day for a great ride. Oh, that does look good, doesn't it? Does look very good indeed. Well done to you, Max. £75 on its way to you, but this is our winner. That's right, this was sent in by Natasha. Taken from, now Natasha has written Lake Miniwanks in uh, the Canadian Rockies in Alberta. We did Google this, didn't we, Dan? We did, yeah, and it turns out there was a slight spelling mistake, but she wasn't trying to fool us because yeah. actually uh, the place is called Lake Miniwanka. Um, over in the Canadian Rockies. Regardless, uh, that is a fantastic photo, isn't it? Is it is indeed. It looks amazing. I definitely want to go there, to yeah. be honest with you. I think that looks like a nice place to go, as well as being a great place to take a picture in front of a signpost. Yeah. Which, uh, one for the Instagram profile, no doubt. Well done to all of you. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. Cycling shorts now, and seeing as we are, what, two thirds of the way through, perhaps the most exciting Tour de France in decades, we are dedicating this segment almost exclusively to that. And a quick heads up, if you want even more snippets from there, then make sure you check out Lloydie's racing news show from yesterday. Yeah, please do. Uh, first up is news that fans are still booing Team Ineos, and more specifically than that, 
Geraint Thomas. Yeah, so this is a tweet from the Yumbo Visma rider, George Bennett. And to paraphrase it, he basically said how disappointing it is that so-called fans of the sport are still acting in this way. Yeah, it is disappointing, isn't it? Although I can't help but think and wonder whether President Emmanuel Macron is also a guilty party at this. Really? How so? Well, I saw these photos from the finish line. You want to see them? Yeah. This is his face when Thibaut Pinot crossed the line. Yay! And then this is his face when Geraint Thomas crossed the line. Ooh. You'll see those again? Yeah. Thibaut Pino. Yay! Geraint Thomas. Now we jest, of course, uh, but it has to be said, I was very much of the Emmanuel Macron expression as well when Thibaut Pino won that stage. I thought it was fantastic. And it was also great to see Julien Alaphilippe doing so well. Yeah. Albeit slightly surprising, I must say. Well, it would be brilliant for the country and for the entire sport if either Alaphilippe or Pino managed to win it. Because let's not forget, the last French winner was 34 years ago in 1985. Yeah, even we were young back then. We were, yeah. That is a long time ago. I was ago. five. What were you, three or two? Uh, One. Oh, what was that, 1945? Two. Yeah, good maths, mate. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Only just put me under pressure. Uh, the team Soudal Lotto suffered a burglary at the Tour de France, losing 50,000 euros worth of equipment. I keep forgetting it's Soudal Lotto for the Tour rather than Lotto Soudal. Yep. Anyway, fortunately for the team, it was nothing to do with their bikes and components, but rather 50,000 euros of camera equipment. So yep. they are out, still able to ride full gas out there on the road, they're just unable to document it all. Yeah, which is a shame because without that camera equipment, we wouldn't have known that they'd won two stages and currently hold the lead in the King of the Mountains competition. So uh, so hopefully, yeah, we can, we can find out through some other means. There was potentially some very good news for women's racing last week as a rumor has been circulating that the women's calendar may be getting a much needed boost in the form of a new stage race that will potentially be to women's cycling what the Tour de France is to men's cycling. Yeah, this came from an ASO official who wished to remain anonymous, but was talking to a Reuters journalist. So fingers crossed it will come true, even though there's been no official communique from ASO just yet. One thing we're reasonably sure about though is that it won't run concurrently with the men's Tour de France for two reasons. Uh, firstly, logistical. That Tour de France is a huge beast these days that's grown over the last 10 years significantly. Uh, but also also because of the demands that would be placed on the media covering the event or events. Now, I can speak firsthand about this. I was up at the Tour de France last week with Eurosport and also speaking to other journalists. They're reaching breaking point midway through just covering the men's. And I think that they would put so much effort into covering both that they do both an injustice. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point to, to mention actually, isn't it? Uh, right, now this time of year is getting on for our favorite time of year, not just because of the racing that's going on, but also because it's time for the transfer rumor mill to really start grinding. And first up, it looks like Arkea Samsic might have been investing. The rumor is that Naira Quintana, Dea Quintana, uh, Diego Rosa, Winner Anacona, and even Nasser Buani will be or already have signed for the team. If true, it's quite an eclectic list of signings, really, isn't it? Isn't it? And I don't want to be cruel to the French second division team, but I can't help but wonder whether if they have signed Nara Quintana, they might just suck out the last bit of energy that he seems to have at this point. Well, I doesn't... just can't see him fitting into a team with a French culture. No, he doesn't seem like he's got much energy at the minute. It's certainly the situation with his current team, Movistar, looks a little bit uncomfortable, mm. doesn't it? Uh, anyway, the rumour mill continues with Team CCC, and it's not surprising that they're looking to boost their roster, because they were very late to the transfer party last year, what with the late confirmation of their title sponsor. But anyway, another eclectic bit of uh, signing is Matteo Trentin, possibly going over from Mitchell and Scott, and also uh, Katusha's GC rider, Ilna Zakharin, as well. Did I say eclectic before? You did, yeah. Eclectic, I meant, sorry. Uh, also, rumours are that EF Education First are going to sign Magnus Court Niels from, from Team Astana, that Kenny Alessandro will be going from Team Ineos over to Trek Segafredo, and finally that Katusha are going to lose Niels Pollitt to De Koenig Quickstep, which would bolster their already quite impressive classics lineup even more. Wouldn't it just? While all eyes might be on bike racing in France at the moment, we were tipped off on another bike race that is apparently the highest bike race 
in the world. And no, it's not one sponsored by Floyds of Leadville. No, this is the Tour of Punjab over in Pakistan. If you think the Tour de France is going to be hard this week, going over to 2,500 meters and above, think again, because this is at 4,700 meters above yeah. sea level. I don't think we can even complain about the altitude of Qinghai Lake anymore. I don't think we can, no. If we're going to do this, we're going to need to send GCN's very own resident daredevil. Who's that? Ollie. And now, it's the moment that thousands of you have been waiting for. We are about to announce the one lucky winner. Sorry, it's probably only five people. Oh yeah, there was sure. We had a, yeah, there? we had a, uh, well, a semi-final. Yeah, very true, Sly. Anyway, thousands of you have been voting and I can't tell you how close it is. In fact, I am gonna tell you how close it is. The top two were separated by a single vote. This is, of course, the chance to win a personalized Orbea Orca Aero. Those top two were Gabriel's gold champion or bear, or Hamish's sunbeam. We had over 4,000 votes between the two of them. One separated it, but the winner is... I thought you were gonna read it out, do you want me to do it? Come on, mate. Okay. Don't leave me hanging. The winner is Hamish. Oh! It is sunbeam. I'm so sorry, Gabriel. That was one incredibly vote. close. Incredibly <laughs> close. Oh, if you just had one more mate, Gabriel. You could oh, have well, no, don't say that. What, what, what would we have done in the case of a draw? Blaney, he's going to text everyone now and be like, seriously, yeah. like, did you vote? And someone will be like, no, I didn't, Gabriel. <laughs> and what, that, what a bike that was. But anyway, let's not, let's not, let's not commiserate with Gabriel. Let's say Hamish. Woohoo! You just got yourself a new bike. Yeah. How cool is that? Unbelievable stuff. I'm so jealous of Hamish. Yeah. But don't despair if you didn't win. Do despair, Gabriel. But the rest of you do not despair because we have another amazing giveaway for you right now. We do indeed. And it's a good job we got the laptop actually because there is so much to win in this. Okay, so first of all, it's for two riders to attend the RBC Grand Fondo Whistler, okay? So for the pair of you, you will get flights to Vancouver from anywhere in the world. Then you get accommodation in Vancouver from Wednesday to Friday, and then in Whistler on the Saturday night. You get a reception invitation to the St. Regis Hotel on Thursday. You get to go to the pasta party on Friday. You obviously get your entries to the Grand Fondo. And then, this is possibly the icing on the cake, Dan. You get a heli jet ride from Whistler back to Vancouver on the Sunday mm -hmm. in time to get your flight home again. How good is that? Quite the VIP experience. Isn't oh it? yeah. All taking place in September. Uh, as Sai mentioned, this giveaway is open to everyone out there, wherever you are located in the world, they will fly you in. Uh, and entries are going to close on Monday the 29th of July at 11 a.m. British summer time. Uh, all details on how to enter this amazing giveaway are, as ever, in the description below. Yeah, and we are gonna be there as well. GCN is gonna be attending. Oh yes. Are we? <laughs> I've not been told about this. Uh, Am I going? You, no, you unfortunately don't get the VIP experience. Right. They said they, they wouldn't allow you in a helicopter and things. Tech of the week now, and it's a first for GCN, wound dressing. Yeah, clearly we are not experts in this subject, but a company called LQD got in touch to tell us about something called a biopolymer dressing. Mm. Well, you say we're not experts in this subject, so I, I was an expert in getting wounds, but not necessarily dressing them. Uh, but any of you out there who are experts in crashing, getting wounds, will no what doubt was? be leaning forward with great interest. And rightly so, because if the clinical trials are anything to go by, this is going to be very interesting for you. That's right. Now, if at the mention of wound dressing, you're expecting us to pull out from underneath our desk of treasures uh, some massive wadge of bandages, then you'll be quite surprised because this is it. Uh, and actually, I'd say it looks less like a wound dressing down and more like one of your very posh moisturizers. It doesn't look too dissimilar to one of my posh moisturizers. Yeah, no, there you go. Uh, now, all you need to do is spray this stuff over your wound, and two minutes later, hey presto, you have a thin, transparent, and elastic film over your wound. Uh, LQD then say that you can either remove that film when you wish, just as you would do with any other bandage or dressing, or you can just leave it on there because eventually it will come off as part of your natural skin renewal. Bonkers, isn't it? Now apparently the V ingredient in there is something called Kytosan FHO2, which as we already mentioned, is a biopolymer. Now I don't know what that is, but I do remember the uh, name of what it comes from, which is chitin, and that is a very common compound 
in nature. And uh, LQD say, and this is backed up by journal articles to support it, that it actually promotes clotting, accelerates wound healing, and also kills common wound pathogens as well. Wow. Yeah, it's just good. amazing, though, isn't it? Imagine going to bed after you've crashed and not sticking to the sheets. <laughs> That's the stuff of dreams, isn't it? it Literally is. the stuff of dreams. You'd actually fall asleep, wouldn't you? you did now, I'm personally hoping not to ever crash on my bike again and get any wounds, but I'm going to take a piece of this home with me just in case I do. Actually, you could have done this last week, couldn't you? For your face. I could have done and spread it on my face. Well, actually, that's a good point. So they say one of the things is that you can spray it on places where you couldn't put bandages. Uh, they've even suggested on saddle sores, which sounds weird, but actually, when you think about it, a good idea, is not it? Layer of film over that bit. Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. Don't forget to get involved. You can either use the uploader, there's a link to that in the description below, or you can use the hashtag GCNHack on social media. Uh, the first one this week, I'm already gonna say is a bodge. Uh, this comes in from Martin Bentoncourt. Uh, I got a new bike yesterday and didn't realize the phone holder wouldn't fit on the cockpit, so I used a Velcro strap for my first ride. My wife says it's a massive bodge, but I disagree. Well, I agree with your wife. I agree with your wife as well. That is that is a horrific bodge. You can't get uh, an amazing new canyon with an aero cockpit and use some Velcro strap to put your iPhone on top of the stem. Well, also, like, how well, I mean, iPhones are slippery things, aren't they? We all know that. Break suddenly and whew, yeah. or if and I, it goes. Or if I did a sprint, that'd be straight out the back. Yeah, good point. <laughs> good point. Uh, right then, uh, next up we've got this from Max Bianchi. Uh, I, I don't know whether this is a hack or a bodge down, because I think it's a real thing. It's a it's a bike with a wooden seat post slash seat tube. But how on earth do you adjust the saddle height? Well, you just you get your hacksaw out, don't you? We, how do you raise it? That's always been the trouble with integrated seat masks, Dan. Yeah. Uh, but there we go. I think that's got to be a hack. Apparently, the damping properties of wood are uh, are fantastic. You, so you think you buy the bike like that? I, d Ready I do. Made from the shop. Well, Absolutely, that's You've yeah. never seen that bike out there. Well, um, unless someone has, has done, sorry, taken the amazing steps of reaming out a. Uh, a old steel tube and replacing it with a broom handle. Well, maybe they have. Maybe they have. Maybe you can help us out at home in okay, the comment section. All right, this came in from Wokesy over on Twitter, and he spotted this over in Vancouver. Uh, it's like a DeLorean that we featured on our channel before, but with even more going on. It's like a musical version of a DeLorean, isn't it? It is a musical it? version of a DeLorean, yeah. There's a lot going on in that, isn't there? A one-person carnival. So much so, I don't even know where to start, so I'm going to no. stop. Well, it's got a nice comfy seat. How about that? Hack. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, next up, this is sent in uh, from David uh, from Oxford here in the UK. He says, not my bike, possibly owned by somebody with two meter legs and whose ass grew sideways. And yet, I can't see why that would exist for any other reason than a very, very lanky person. Unless it's some kind of bicycle ejector seat that's just gone off. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. It's certainly a theft prevention device. Well, it's certainly a bodge, in my opinion. Uh, next up, we have this from Trevor. Uh, I was watching the Gastown Grand Prix when I spotted this. As exciting as the race was, this took my full attention in several minutes in an attempt to figure out why. I didn't arrive at an answer. Maybe you can. Well, maybe we can't, Si. Well, so, to help the viewers out, first you were looking at a bicycle with no brake levers on the handlebars, yeah. then... And I think that's a specialised bicycle, <laughs> if I recognise it correctly. I think you're probably right, Dan. <laughs> but then, check out those brake levers on a handlebar mounted just behind the saddle. I can only draw one conclusion from this, Dan, that it's an ass brake. Whoever's riding that bike is using their butt to activate their brakes with. Well, yeah, it's like a literal ass saver, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Which I don't know why, I'm sure there's a good reason, because that's a proper, like, there's a bit of time and effort going yeah. into that. But the only problem with it is if you brake suddenly, the momentum would be forcing you forward, thereby taking pressure off your brake levers. So the harder you brake, yeah. the less you brake. You, you see what I mean? You'd get a lot of skid marks too, couldn't you? <laughs> Right, so that's all for the hack forward slash boss section this week. Don't forget to submit your entries for this time next week. That didn't even make sense. No, I didn't, no. Well, at least you laughed. Yeah, I did, yeah. Just mentioning skid marks. Caption competition now, your weekly chance to win a G-SYN Camelback water bottle. Uh, last week's caption photo was this one from the Tour de France of Vincenzo Nibali shaking hands with Geraint Thomas. Uh, the caption winner is this. It's from Christopher Krustrup. Caption, Vincenzo, did you know that whales are faster than sharks? And Sai has to spend the last 35 to 40 minutes researching whether or not that's true. And the trouble is, Dan, the results uh, from my research are actually quite inconclusive. Uh, I can't 
work out. I think it's a whale. I think uh, a fin whale is the fastest uh, at 47 miles per hour when it jumps, whereas it's the Mako shark that clocks at 31.1 miles per hour. But but the results have varied so dramatically across the internet. That I don't <laughs> across know what's different true. websites. Yeah. Yes. Regardless, Christopher, you are winner of the GSN Camelback water bottle. Send us your address as a Facebook message, and we'll get that off to you. One I thing I did discover: the fastest thing in the ocean is a sailfish that goes 68 miles per hour. That's over 100 kilometers per hour through water. And how fast does an octopus go, Simon? 24 <laughs> miles an hour, 24.9 miles an hour for an octopus. Slimy. How on earth does an octopus go 25 miles an hour? That's faster than you on an aero bike on land. Yeah, the things you learn whilst filming or watching a GCN show, especially during the caption competition. We should put that little nugget right up front, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah. This week in the Coming world of cycling, week, I've yeah. learned that an octopus goes 24.9 miles yeah. an hour. We investigate whether ketones are having dramatic effects on the Tour de France, and what is the fastest fish? Uh, right, this week's photo, which we'll get onto now, is this one of Alejandro Valverde on a mountain somewhere at the Tour de France. Uh, I shall get you started. My word, this new face out thing is going everywhere. <laughs> Ooh! Ouch! Zing, Alejandro! Yeah, right. Give your best <laughs> captions in the comment section down below and please uh, make them a bit simpler so we don't have to do all this research, or at least Sai doesn't. He's only just a little bit older than you, but uh, he does look like he's doing better than you in that respect, doesn't he? Okay, we're getting on to comment of the week now, where we pick out some of our favourite comments that you've been leaving under our videos from the last seven days. The beginning of which is Ask GCN Training. So you submit your training questions and we pick the best one out and answer it with the help of Zwift's coaches. As an added bonus, not only do you get your question answered, you also get three months free subscription to Zwift. Yeah, and the winner, the winner of that prize this week is Blake Harper, who wrote, to what extent is it possible to train sprinting form indoors on a smart trainer? For example, for cadence, I've noticed I can easily hit 150 RPM on my tax, but I struggle to get it above 130 without bouncing when I'm outdoors on my Colnago. Do you have any advice? Yeah, it's probably because you're using a Colnago, isn't it? I guess that's probably the difference. Uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, there's two parts to this, aren't there, really? There's the discrepancy in leg speed between indoors and outdoors, and then actually the ultimate power output discrepancy between indoors and outdoors. And when you look at the first one, leg speed, I think perhaps the main reason that's so uh, vastly different is due to the lack of resistance that you can get when you're riding indoors. So you can remove it obviously things like wind resistance, you can remove rolling resistance, and ultimately what you just get is resistance from the drivetrain, so you can just spin for your life. There's the other fact as well, that when you're an indoor trainer, that trainer is basically propping your bike up for you like a stand, so every ounce of energy that you're putting into your bike is going into achieving the maximum cadence, which is why you've probably got a discrepancy. Yeah, I'd say that's probably even more important actually, isn't it? The good news about this, though, is that actually if you're seeing improvements in leg speed indoors, then that pretty much definitely translates to outdoors, doesn't it? Certainly the Zwift coaches would think that, and I think I agree with it too. Yeah, and there's another aspect of this, which as you mentioned is the peak power output, and there's no doubt that as you've mentioned, you're probably finding a higher peak power output outside versus indoors, and that's for the complete opposite reason. The fact that you've got it in the stand means you can't manoeuvre the bike and use your upper body to get that extra power output out. No, that's right, whereas when you are outside, uh, even skinny little arms like ours can add a little bit extra <laughs> yeah. to the bike, aren't they? Three, maybe four watts <laughs> each arm. Um. Yes, exactly. Uh, despite this, even with, uh, as you've seen, the difference in leg speed will have a benefit training indoors versus outdoors. And actually, the same is true of power output, isn't it? If you boost your power output indoors, either through resistance training or max sprint, it will definitely translate onto the outside as well, isn't it? Yeah, so in short, it's a bit the same as doing threshold efforts, isn't it? Likely it is, it'll be lesser indoors versus outdoors, but it's still worth doing as part of your weekly routine because it will transfer out onto the real world, or into the real world, shall I say. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit like doing gym stuff, isn't it? Doing weights, and that can boost your peak power, even though you're not pedaling, you're just lifting weights. Yeah, but you then don't transfer it out to the real world, do you? What, what weights are you lifting? Only when you move house or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, wish you the best of luck with it. Right then, on to comments left under other videos uh, from last week. Uh, underneath uh, Egan Bernal's Pinarella Dogma F12 X Lite, uh, much irrigatory yeah. uh, said, uh, 
Dan's disdain for doing free hub sound checks is palpable. Mm. Uh, less palpable than when Jeremy did a free hub sound check, but still, yeah. Well, happy now. I don't mind doing them, but when I forget, I get slaughtered in the comments. That's yeah. what I'm worried about. Yeah. Anyway, underneath too tough for the Tour de France, we have this from our robot man. Uh, considering he was keeping up with a legend on an e-bike most of the way, Sai is seriously a beast. Yeah. Did you put that comment in? But I did, mate. I couldn't believe you read it out, but uh, thanks very much for that. Yes, read it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, then, underneath uh, Ollie's great video, which is what Tour de France riders eat for lunch, uh, Scott Mayers uh, sort of pointed out that, that Ollie's description of caffeine gels might have been a bit obvious. Yeah. And there are caffeine gels, which are gels with caffeine in them, uh, to which DC replied, for caffeine, I just prefer a cup of coffee, which is a cup with coffee in it. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Ollie does claim that he did that deliberately for humour, but we're not sure if we believe him. Oh, yes. Uh, finally, this week, we had this from I am one INA one million. One in uh, a million. This. See? Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, I am I'm one in a million. So yeah. silly. Uh, right, this story would be so much more interesting if these guys were naked. Just saying, folks. That is weird. Oh, somebody replied saying that's weird. <laughs> well, I think it's probably a. Uh... A reference to a comment that we got last week, which said that uh, we should start doing maintenance videos. Naked. Oh, I see, right. Uh, oh, I didn't bother uh, watching last week's show because I wasn't in it. You were busy, mate, yeah. Uh, right, anyway, what is coming up on the channel this week? <laughs> well, on Wednesday, we are going to show you the secrets to better recovery. Oh, yes. Uh, also, on that same day, we're going to tell you how Tour de France climbers go up those climbs so blooming fast. Uh, Thursday, we're going to have a look at what Strava Summit is. Is that something you've been looking into? It is indeed, yeah. And then we're also going to look at what could be the most brutal stage of this year's Tour de France, the penultimate day up to Val Turenne on stage. Stage 20. No gravel this time. No. Significantly easier than it was on Sunday. And then Friday, we've got the latest edition of Meet the Presenters. This time, of course, with J Pow. Oh, yes. Powers. Uh, now, on Saturday, this is the one that you've all been waiting for. This is where GCN's resident daredevil. Hank uh, teamed up with ultra endurance legend Mark Beaumont to recreate stage one of the first ever Tour de France. It's utterly brutal, utterly inhumane. But watch on Saturday to find out how they got on. Uh, and then on Sunday, equally inhumane, we tested to see if triathletes can ride bikes. Yep. Yeah. Find out the answer to that one. Uh, uh, we, no, obviously. Well, yeah, we did need um, quite a few bottles of this stuff. <laughs> uh, Monday, we're back with the race new show. Tuesday, back in the set for the GSN show. Don't forget, you can also catch daily highlights wherever you are in the world of the Tour de France over on our new channel, GCN Racing. Well, we're getting towards the end of the GCN show now, but as ever, we have Extreme Corner for you. And this week, it's less extreme and more just remarkable, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, this week in the world of cycling, we learned that Ruby Isaac is way better on the rollers and everything else than we are. Whoa. Hashtag skills. Yeah, How many takes do you reckon though? Pretty first go. No, probably maybe. first go, but maybe uh, maybe she can let us know. Uh, anyway, one more point of business before we leave you for this week, and that is to say that the GCN events this summer, GCN of Voriaz, we've been told there's one more room available, just one more, so one opportunity to catch up with such delights as Lloydie's Pub Quiz and the GCN Show Live, as well as the amazing riding on offer in that part of the French Alps, but there are a couple more at GCN Salbach, which is the end of August. So. I've already had only just over a week away now, isn't it? Looking forward Crikey. to that. Looking You're going to leave your quiz training more last minute. minute this time, aren't you? I'm not doing any. Not, not training at all? Just going into it cold. Tapering from uh, GCM Mallorca in March. Yeah, mid-March to now. Anyway, hopefully I'll be all right. Fingers crossed, but we're with the slow group, whoever's in that. There we go. Right, that's all for this week's GCN show. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up just down below. I've said it again. People oh. get mad in the comments about that. And if you'd like some more content, I was actually out at the Tour de France last week, so I'm not sure if I mentioned it, uh, but I visited Dimension Data and NTT, one of the same company, to find out how they're using data to bring fans closer to the Tour de France than ever before. It's down here somewhere just need a thumb up. <laughs>